Now we're ready to tackle the process of cell division. And when you think about it, without cell division, of course, no life on Earth as we know it would be in existence. And because of the cell theory, which posits that all life on Earth has descended from some single cell in the past, uh, cell division lies at the very heart of what we are, who we are, and what all life on Earth is. So it's a very important process, and we're going to be spending a lot of time looking at it. And as you can see here, these wonderful processes of cell division are mysterious and elegant all at the same time. And fortunately, we're living in a time when we know something about the molecular processes that underlie these types of cell division. Here we are looking at synchronized nuclear division in an early Drosophila embryo. And these nuclei are dividing at very rapid rates in order to supply the embryo with the requisite number of nuclei that will later be partitioned into cells uh, that are needed for to, uh, are needed to form the embryo. So let's begin our treatment of cell division by first looking at uh, fission, cell division in bacteria. Bacteria divide by a process we call binary fission because there's no sexual life cycle whatsoever. There's simple cloning of individual cells as they uh, reproduce, divide into two. Uh, reproduction is clonal. And in the process, the genetic material, of course, must be replicated to be passed on in equal parts to both daughter cells produced by binary fission. And, they, and they, the bacterial chromosome is circular, circular, and that circular chromosome is replicated during the process of cell division. And this, the process of replicating the bacterial circular chromosome begins at a single defined point uh, defined by a sequence in the bacterial chromosome that is the origin of replication. We call that the origin. And there is where the macromolecular machinery responsible for replicating the bacterial DNA assembles at the origin of replication. And from that origin, replication proceeds in a bidirectional manner away from the origin until a site of termination is reached at the opposite side of the chromosome. And then finally, a septum forms that divides the cell into two cells. So here's the process shown schematically. Um, the origin of replication is indicated schematically in green here, and the termination of replication of the bacterial chromosome is shown in red. And the double blue lines here represent double-stranded DNA. So replication begins at the origin and proceeds bidirectionally, and here we see two replication forks moving out from the origin of replication in either direction, producing two daughter molecules simultaneously. And when the replication machinery of this replication fork meets the re replication machinery of this replication fork at the termination site, termination of DNA synthesis ensues. And then we have two daughter circular chromosomes that move to opposite ends of the bacterial cell, and a septum is formed midway between the ends of the cell. And that septum is assembled using a variety of proteins, one of which, as we will see, is called the FTSZ protein. And as the septum forms and cell wall material and plasma membrane is assembled, we eventually bud off two uh, daughter cells, each genetically identical to the parental cell because their DNA is identical to the parental cell, assuming no mutations have occurred in the process <laughs> excuse me, of replication. And here is a fluorescent micrograph in which antibodies against the FTSZ protein have been applied. And you can see that this is a, um, represents a, a kind of a circle of the FTSZ TSZ protein, and that FTSZ protein is, uh, uh, is a, a signal for proteins that will form the septum to assemble in the middle of the cell. And then we have a radial constriction of the plasma membrane and cell wall at the at the midpoint where this uh, where the assemblage of the septum proteins have formed. And interestingly enough, the FTZ protein here shown here in fluorescence, the FTSZ protein has similarity to the tubulin protein that forms um, 
the microtubules in eukaryotic cells. Although the function of tubulin in cell division in, in eukaryotes is quite different than the, the workings of the FTSZ protein, it's very interesting that there is homology between the F bacterial FTSZ protein and a protein that forms a, a, a um, this part of the cytoskeleton was this, which is essential to partition eukaryotic chromosomes to opposite sides of the cell during eukaryotic cell replication. <clears throat> so let's compare schematically some uh, varieties of cell division. We've already covered the prokaryotic bacterial cell division process in superficial in a superficial manner. Now let's look at some uh, eukaryotes and there's quite a bit of diversity across the eukaryotic kingdom in terms of what how, how cells divide and how chromosomes are partitioned to opposite poles. For example, in some single-celled eukaryotes, some protists, the nuclear membrane remains intact during the entire process of, of um, partitioning of chromosomes to opposite poles, and microtubules are formed that actually tunnel through the nucleus. And the chromosomes are separated and, and are, are moved to opposite ends of the cell in these protists um, by a mechanism that does not involve attachment directly to microtubules. Whereas in other protists, we have a similar type of arrangement, except that the, um, there are microtubules that, that bind to the uh, kinetochore, which is the point at which uh, microtubules attach to chromosomes, and it is the pulling of the chromatids apart by these microtubules that accounts for the movement of the chromosomes as cell division proceeds in these protists. And we'll, we'll talk more about kinetochores and the microtubule spindle later on. In some yeasts, the, uh, in yeasts rather, the nuclear membrane remains intact as it did in the, as it does in the protists, but here the spindle apparatus is actually assembled within the nucleus and is responsible for attaching to chromosomes and pulling them apart. In addition, there are um, polar, what we call polar microtubules. And in animals, we have the following situation. When chromosomes are being uh, separated in mitosis, a spindle is formed organized by centrioles, a pair of centrioles at either pole of the cell, and the kinetochore microtubules attach to the kinetochores, the central part of the chromosome, and are responsible for pulling them apart. There are also polar microtubules, as there were in yeasts, but there are also these astral microtubules that uh, assemble around the centrioles. So we really have three types of microtubules. We have, in animal cells, we have um, the, we have the astral microtubules, Aster means star in, in Greek, so astral, we have the astral microtubules. We have the polar microtubules, which extend end to end and can actually even be out like this and can extend from overlap in the center of the, of the cell. And then we have the kinetochore microtubules, the, kineto, the kinetochore microtubules. So we have three types of microtubules that are organized by the centrioles in animal cells and that form what we would call the spindle apparatus that is responsible for partitioning the chromosomes in animal cells. So let's now treat uh, the eukaryotic chromosome um, and talk about eukaryotic chromosome structure and the arrangement within eukaryotes. So Every species, of course, has a different number of chromosomes. There are some, uh, there's a fern, I think, that has over 500 chromosomes. Uh, a species of newt to have um, many, many chromosomes in the hundreds. So uh, chromosome number is not related to organism complexity or um, re recent evolution in the evolutionary tree of life. Humans, as it turns out, have 46 chromosomes that are in 23 uh, pairs of chromosomes. And when one of these chromosomes is missing or is present in an extra copy, that is usually fatal. Um, so the, the right ploidy, the right number of chromosomes is very essential to proper functioning of cells 
and organisms. So humans have 46 chromosomes in 23 pairs. 23 of those chromosomes are inherited through the sperm, and 23 of those are inherited through the egg. We'll, and we'll talk about the human karyotype, or the um, arrangement of chromosomes, shortly. So let's talk about chromosome structure briefly. Chromosomes are composed of chromatin. And when the, um, back in the 1800s actually, so in the 1800s, the uh, chemical, the uh, chemical industry was very interested in producing organic dyes. And these were largely produced uh, as the process, uh, processes of, of uh, organic chemistry were discovered uh, largely in Germany. And the German fabric industry was very interested in the organic chemists' production of organic dyes because these could be used to, to dye fabric. And this had enormous economic implications because prior to this, the only way to have colored clothes was to extract pigments from plants. And, and um, the, the repertoire of colors was rather actually fairly limited. So when the organic dyes were developed by organic chemists and methods for synthesis of organic dyes in the laboratory were discovered, uh, the, the ability to dye fabrics numerous colors uh, was obtained and that had tremendous economic import. Well, when cytologists uh, got a hold of some of these organic dyes and used them to stain cells in the study of cytology or the study of cells, was some of these organic dyes were found to light up, to label a structure in the cell which had only been dimly visualized before, and this was the nucleus. And what these organic dyes we now know were doing was that they were staining, they were binding to the DNA within the nucleus. But at that time, the cytologists didn't really know about DNA, and they called the material within the nucleus that was staining with the organic dyes, they called this colored stuff, or chromatin. Chromos in Greek means color, tin means kind of stuff. So this, this, was, this material was referred to as colored stuff. And as cell cycle, as the cell cycled into, into, divide, into division, it was noted that the colored stuff, the chromatin, actually condensed into bodies, colored bodies. And these were called then chromosomes. Chromo again means color, somes in Greek means body. So these were colored bodies. These chromosomes were colored bodies. It's all stained by the organic dyes. And it was noted that the, the chromatin and chromosomes kind of were interchangeable, that this was a cycle. It would go back and forth between very condensed chromosomes and very diffuse chromatin. So chromatin is, is referred to as, as diffuse, and chromosomes represent very condensed chromatin, in other words. So this is a cycle that occurs in the chromatin as cells go through the cell division cycle. Uh, we know that chromosomes are the site of RNA synthesis. It's where genes are transcribed into RNA. And we know that in, um, that in eukaryotes, DNA of a single chromosome is one long, continuous, double-stranded DNA molecule. So every chromosome is a single molecule of DNA and associated proteins. Uh, Chromatin, remember, is a complex of DNA and protein. And uh, if you were to average the typical human chromosome, you're looking at about 140 million nucleotides in length. And in the non-dividing nucleus, uh, we can divide the chromatin into two, into two states. The heterochromatin, which is highly condensed and is not expressed, and the euchromatin, which is less condensed, more diffuse, and is expressed. So genes found in heterochromatin are not turned on for mechanism, by mechanisms we'll talk about, whereas genes found in euchromatin that is more loosely packaged DNA, uh, that, that, those genes can be expressed. And that's where we'll pick up with uh, next time with uh, further treatment of chromosome structure.